Purim drinking. Drinking in Purim. Do we have to do it? What about it? What are the parameters? Something we have been discussing over the course of multiple episodes, discussing rabbis throughout multiple centuries on this. And that's something we're going to continue discussing on this episode of The Jewish Drinking Show, bringing L'chaim to life. L'chaim. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm excited to welcome back fifth time guest to the show, Rabbi David Freed. Welcome, Rabbi Freed. Thank you. It's exciting to be back here. Absolutely. And I believe this makes Rabbi Freed the very first ever fifth time guest to the show. We've had a fourth time uh, appearances, but this is the first fifth time guest. So that's very exciting. This will be the fourth forum episode that we're discussing. And for listeners, viewers who haven't caught any, or perhaps even only some of them, they've all been Aside from the very first episode we had Rabbi Freed on, we have been discussing the Purim, uh, drinking on Purim. So uh, guests, I'm sorry, visitors can go and check out. Uh, we did one on medieval rabbis on Purim drinking. We did one on 15th and 16th century rabbis on Purim drinking. And one on, I'm sorry, on 16th and 17th and another on 18th and 19th century rabbis on Purim drinking. So that has, um, that's the historical context leading up into that. So that's actually really great. Anybody who wants to get a better context for this episode, as we discuss, not all, not a range, but just two uh, very particular 20th century rabbis on the topic of Purim drinking. But before we get to them, I just want to, so for those maybe perhaps less familiar with Rabbi Freed, he teaches Judaic studies at the Ramaz Upper School. He is also an editor and frequent contributor at the Lair House. He lives in New Jersey with his wife, Molly, and their two sons, Elchanan and Sadia. He earned his rabbinic ordination from my very own, my very own alma mater, YCT Rabbinical School. So welcome back, Rabbi Freed. Thank you. The two rabbis that we're looking at, we're considering their writings in terms of Purim drinking today. Well, the first one, well, how did you how did you choose them? How did you decide upon these? So the first one is Rakuk, which I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. But, you know, you insist that we have to do this chronologically. <laughs> it's funny because I didn't know you were all about getting to this. But actually, now, I mean, there's a little bit of a tease to the listeners. But now that I read it, I'm like, ooh, this is super duper fascinating. Right. So and what I really like about that piece is mm-hmm. he... He, push, he pushes back on what's been sort of the general trend that we've seen among the Akron. I mean, like, the reason we don't have too many sources from the 20th century is when I tried to look for 20th century sources, most of them just quote the 19th century sources. There wasn't all that much original I could find. I'm sure someone out there knows something I missed. Ruf Cook, born in Europe, 19th century. Um, one parent a Chassid, one parent a Misnagid. Um, uh, for those keeping track at home, Ruff Cook was 1865 to 1935. Yeah, I don't know all the dates off the top of my head. So That's yeah, funny. he is, you know, he learned he learns in Volodzhin, which is obviously, you know, the big Litzvish Yeshiva, but also deeply influenced by Hasidus. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the leading um supporters of of early religious Zionism, uh, moves to Israel first, uh first chief rabbi of Palestine, as it was then known, much more well known for his philosophical and mystical stuff. And, mm. but he also, he also wrote halakha. So. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's lesser well known about him. I don't think people are, know really him for his halakha writings, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, other than, other than, um, Hedger Mechira by, uh, by Shemitah, that's the one halakha piece from Roko people know. Right, right. Which is also relevant for grapes and vineyards. So, yeah. So what I really liked about this Rukuk piece is the way he pushes back on on that general trend that we've seen. Obviously, we'll talk more about that mm-hmm. soon. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting because you mentioned the 20th century rabbis generally just quote the 19th century rabbis. And then there were a couple of we had at, at the end of the 19th that bled into the 20th century. Very specifically, I'm thinking about both the Aruch HaSholchan and Mishnah Burr, which were published around the turn of the 20th century. So they yeah, can really work sure. both ways I mean, on that. You know, Rav Cook is basically a contemporary with the Mishnah Burr, but mm. you know, just based on when the works were published, we decided to yeah. do Rav Cook as a 20th century piece and the Mishnah Burr as a 19th century piece. Yeah, and and it also works out well, as, as you mentioned, with Rev Cook. Like, he's pushing back. He's, in a, in a way, he's kind of pushing back, definitely responding to a lot of the previous writings on this topic. Yeah. Here's the Rev Cook piece. In the basic background that Rev Cook is responding to is the Chaye Adam, which we discussed in the previous 
uh, per mm-hmm. episode we did. Elia Rabba yes. was really focused just on matters of the meal. Inyane Suda, he talked about be careful with Nitila Idai and Birchan Amazon. Those are you should be careful about. He really, right here, Rabbi Danzig really adds on. Well, well so he adds, right, he Mara's, adds Tila onto it. He adds, like, don't you know, you know, the point that, you know, you're not, if you're, if you're drunk, you're not allowed to dive in. If you're so drunk, it may not even, you may not even be Ote Bidi And he says, if, if you're going to wind up missing Minchar Mariv, uh, then, then for sure, you know, don't drink so much that you're going to not be able to dive in Minchar Mariv. So, yes, he adds on that. He yeah, says, Mutav Shuli Shtaker. <laughs> what? Better you shouldn't get drunk. And also, you know, implicitly, all of the later Akronim who quote the Chayadim, including the Mr. Brewer and the Arach Shulchan, as we discussed, this caution from the Chayadim of whatever you might hold about drinking on Purim, remember, it doesn't override any other mitzvah. If it's going to cause you to miss Mariv or, you know, or any other mitzvah, don't do it. So, you know, whatever you might think about the sugya and what's shot in the sugya and how we should paskin between the Rishonim, like, but even if you think, like, the halacha is you're supposed to drink, you're supposed to get drunk, but, like, that's only if you could do it without forgetting any other mitzvah. If you're going to be too drunk to daven, like, forget it. Don't drink. Mm-hmm. And Rav Cook really pushes back on that and says, well, wait a second. We have a principle in halacha, osek ba mitzvah, pater mina mitzvah. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, if you're involved in doing one mitzvah, you're exempt from doing other mitzvah. He says, look. If we hold that there's a mitzvah to drink on Purim, so then if you miss out on another mitzvah because because you were fulfilling the mitzvah drinking on Purim, so that's no big deal. All right, so can we go through this because this is it's both short enough, but also like rich enough, I think, for us to to go through. And we have the Hebrew here and a translation in, in, into English, the language our, our current lingua franca. He starts off right or show light here. I like I have a note I want to make for you. My my dekasha leala chay adam a, a difficulty I have with the chay adam the od poskim and you know acknowledging that many quote the chay adam shekatzvush im lo yid palel mitzat hashichur lo yishtaker that if if you would refrain from davening as a result of drunkenness so you shouldn't get drunk on parim kaven denaktina karova poskim the adalei yadahu mitzvah he says well, wait a second we hold like you know obviously we've seen not everyone agreed but we hold like. <laughs> We hold like the majority of poskim who say that Adalayada is in fact a mitzvah. There really is a mitzvah to drink until you don't know the difference between Mordechai and Haman. Mm-hmm. Right, at the very least, Simcha. The very it may not be an independent mitzvah, but it, at the very least, it's within that broader mitzvah Derabanan of Simchat Purim. So Imkan he says who osek by mitzvah. You're considered someone who's involved in one mitzvah. Velama, velama lo yiftar mitzvah. So why why wouldn't you be exempt from tefillah again? Implicitly, uh, getting into this concept, if you're doing one mitzvah, so you're exempt from other mitzvot. Then he you know he goes down a little bit of a different path to try and make the point. He says at the very least, at the very least, you should be considered as someone who was honest, who was unintentional in their missing of tefillah. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you were drunk, mm-hmm. So he's, refer- he's referencing a bunch of different concepts here. He said, let's say, let's say it wasn't for him. Let's say you just got drunk, right? You, mm-hmm. No good reason. You just decided to drink a lot that night and you couldn't dive in. Or uh, maybe there was a good reason, but. Maybe there was a good reason. I don't know. Yeah. But, but he's not saying, he's not, it's not relevant to his argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he says that's considered on us for, 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 regarding Tesh Lumen. So Tesh Lumen, you know, background for any viewers who don't know what he's referencing here. If you miss a tefillah by accident, so you do what's called tashlum, and you make it up. You dive in two shmona esrays the next the next time around. Mm-hmm. Um, if you miss it on purpose, you can't do it. Mm-hmm. So he says, he's referencing halacha, that if you missed it because you were drunk, that's considered by accident. That's not considered on purpose. So then he has a question, okay, but like, are you allowed to put yourself in a situation where you know you're going to be missing something by accident? By the way, I, I, I as a side comment, it is fascinating because there is actually in in the Bavali in Erevin, that there is a, an explicit to, uh, Tanayitic text that says, if you are drunk, you're exempt from prayer. You're, you're patramin hatfila. However, even though there's a very uh, explicit Talmudic text about that, it doesn't really seem to get um, amplified or really carried on throughout subsequent halachic liter- literature. He's right. going to go to the Rambam about, you know, Bavali Besfina and Shabbos to prove yeah. his point, right? He's not right. going to go to a Gemara about drunkenness. That's interesting. Right, right. I mean, at the same time, so obviously I would have gone in the Talmudic route, but at the same time, 
I can understand why he's not picking up on that because it doesn't really seem to get a lot of attention in subsequent in, in post dominic right. literature. He wants something. He wants something with precedent, right? So right. now he says, "Lahafke right. asma baones ein ister medina bemakomets." He says, "This is normally normally he acknowledges you wouldn't want to put yourself in a situation where you know you're going to be prevented from davening in the end." But he says, "But for the sake of a mitzvah, certain you're certainly you're allowed to." And he compares this to. He compares this to the question of, can I get on a boat before Shabbos, knowing that I'm going to have to do malacha on the boat on Shabbos because of Pikuach Nefesh, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that, because if you don't, you know, you'll die if you don't, like, keep the boat afloat on Shabbos. (laughs) So can I get get on the boat, right? I know I'm going to have to do Mechal Shabbos if I get on this boat. So normally, normally we say, you know, if it's too close to Shabbos, you shouldn't. But he says, but 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 quoting the Rambam here, he says, but for its bar mitzvah, you can. For its bar mm-hmm. mitzvah, you're allowed to get on that boat right before Shabbos, even knowing that, you know, even knowing that you're going to have to be Michal Shabbos in order to keep yourself alive on that boat on Shabbos. So mm-hmm. he says, if it's good enough for Shabbos, it should be good enough for Marev, right? If it's, uh, <laughs> right, I should be able to, for this, you know, even if like, if there's, if there were no mitzvah on an ordinary day, it would be a bad idea to get myself drunk knowing I won't be able to dive in, but. On Purim, when there's a mitzvah to do it for the sake of the mitzvah, to get myself drunk, knowing that now I'm going to be an honest, I won't be able to dive in. Okay, that should be allowed. Right? So, mm-hmm. so why should there be any prohibition to um, get yourself drunk knowing that you're going to miss this mitzvah de Rabbanon of davening Mariv when you're going to be filling, fulfilling the mitzvah de Rabbanon of Simcha? So, yeah, basically, it says, like, if you had to be super careful and not drink enough that you're not going to have as the Gemara should have said so. And, and, right, it's, <laughs> and, you know, and he says, you know, forget about, you know, forget about super drunk. Like we Paskin, if you've had a ravine of wine, you shouldn't dive in. Mm-hmm. So, right, the Gemara never should have, the Gemara must have known that, you know, people wouldn't be able to dive in. It said it anyway. So, and then, mm-hmm. and the, so clearly, clearly there's no issue. And he says that, therefore, I'm going to be, I'm going to be makil on the question of davening, which is really being machmer on, on Simchas Parim. Yeah. So I, there's a lot for me to love about this. And I think any, most listeners to this, I think are very sympathetic to ultimately his conclusion, which I am as well. But I think what, and I'm curious to hear from you, what you particularly enjoy about it, but what I actually really, really, really enjoy more than just the result is his process. Like, I love that he's actually like, first of all, I love the just straightforward dry halakhic stuff. Like, that's you know that that sort of halachic meat and potatoes. It's it's really wonderful. But I think even better is he's uh, a. I, I really like the you know like you're engaged in one sort of mitzvah. Okay, sorry you can't do tefillah right now. You're already I'm I'm busy with another mitzvah. Sorry, too bad. And like that's totally. But I love what you just like, especially at the end of if we even say a revise of wine that sort of takes you out of ability to to pray. So why was this even established in the first place? <laughs> like and. and you know, it, back in the Gemara, like, it's not like they didn't know what they were doing. So I, I really enjoy sort of these just multiple, and, and it's all so short, right? He's getting in so much within such a short, compact, it's like really efficient halachic writing. Yeah. I mean, what I really like about this is like the fact that he's willing to just, you know, push back on conventional wisdom. I love independent thinkers. You know, I love, so mm-hmm. I love the fact that he's not going to go the same trend as everyone else. And he's going to, you know, try and bring in another show again and say, that, you know, there's mm-hmm. another way we could look at this. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, I have a serious critique of what he says here. Ooh, wait, wait, before we get to the critique, I, I also want to jump on the, the loving bandwagon, which is, it's not just that he's pushing back and sort of marching to the beat of a different drummer is that it's, it's not just for the sake of doing it. It's like, what is the point of this mitzvah? I think he's really saying like, why are we letting tefillah, you know, interfere with and otherwise compress or mitigate the ability to, to perform this one mitzvah? Like just because of prayer, like let's actually perform this mitzvah. Like this is one day a year. I like it a lot. All right, fine. What's the criticism? <laughs> he quotes half the Chayadam. Uh, yeah. 
he, you know, he has this whole big thing. Okay, it's it's, it's a mitzvah derabanan, so certainly it should override the other mitzvah derabanan of davening marif. So if you look at the chayadim, the chayadim says if it's going to lead you not to do any mitzvah like tefillat arvit or berkat hamazon, you shouldn't drink. He conveniently okay. left out what the chayadim said about berkat hamazon. Berkat hamazon is a mitzvah derabanan, and. Uh, <laughs> that's good that's good and this, i mean it could be said and, and to sort of step up and defend rev cook like okay how much can one really actually not do and and, and i will also say whereas in the gemara and all subsequent halakhic literature if you're uh if you are you know in a drunken state yeah prayer is not something you should be doing at all but in subsequent halakhic literature yeah, you can drunkenly say Birchat Hamazon. That's totally fine. Check the Shulchan Aruch and every, you know, like that's fine. Right. Yeah. So no, I, I think right. I think that is right. I think that is a big difference. Level of drunkenness, not to be able to bench, than not to be able to dive in mire. So right. he may just he may just say, "All right, like don't get that drunk that you can't bench." I agree. We'll agree <laughs> with we'll we'll agree with the Chayyadam on that one. But you right. know, to the you know the Ravi is that you can't dive in mire. That I'm not concerned about. <laughs> right. Right. And and I think it was clever. I don't think that was an act. And I think it was very intentional, even just for the purposes I mentioned uh, of just like, OK, so you can't do Tefila, but Birchad Amazon, like how badly in are you? But right. he could have ended that, you know, he could have ended it with an explicit note of caution. He said, but by the way, still don't make sure you get so drunk that you can't do the Mitzvah Do Right Avenging. He doesn't add, he doesn't add that note of caution at the end. <laughs> That's good. I like it. I like it. And I'm so glad you shared this text with me. This is. This is very good. Hey there, it's Adar. This is a Purim episode. If you want to find out more Purim episodes or just simply other resources about Purim, feel free to check out jewishdrinking.com slash Purim. Again, jewishdrinking.com slash Purim for resources, articles, essays, clips, and so much more all about Purim. Thank you. Now back into the episode. What can you, how, how would you like to introduce this text? What, 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 what speaks to you about it? What have you found interesting in he takes us on a wild journey <laughs> is the best way to put it. It, it starts it, out. It, you know what? You know out, what? It's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite of Rev Cook. Rev Cook, it's, it's efficient. It's terse. It's all within, you know, let's just stick to halakhic stuff that's really relevant. Rev Hutner says, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I mean, it's funny, right? Like when you talk about we're going to do a piece for Rev Cook, most, most people don't think, oh, I'm going to get short, terse, dry halakha. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. right. Not, not, your, not your typical Rav Cook piece. Rav Hutner, um, also born in Europe, uh, lived in 1906 and 1906. perished in 1980. Um, briefly studied in Israel, where he definitely met Rav Cook. I don't know hmm. the extent of their relationship, although Rav Cook gave a haskama to Rav Hutner's first day fair. Oh, neat. Okay. And then when the second edition was printed, it no longer had that stone. And then ultimately, Rav Hutner came to America. He was the Roshiva at Yeshiva Chaim Berlin in Brooklyn. He is known for his work, the Pachad Yitzchak, which is primarily on the uh, Machshava pieces on the on the different Jewish holidays. Jewish um, philosophy, right? Yes. Philosophical, yeah. Philosophical pieces on the Jewish holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, he has... His first sefer, the one with Haskamer from Cook, was a book of was a book of Lamdus on, on, on Yavamo, so perfectly capable of doing that as well. Well, speaking of Pachad Yitzhak, which how do we translate Isaac's fear, Isaac's I mean, dread? Guess, yeah, something like that. Yes, right. It's in right. It's, it's in that genre of Sfarim who are named God. Oh, right in that uh, theonym, theonyms, right? Right, right. Pachad Yitzhak in the Torah is you know the one who Yitzhak was afraid of, meaning yes. God. Isaac's dread, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the first one of that genre, I believe, was the Magen of Ram. Oh, Abraham Shield. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that was that was highly controversial, and he had to republish it under a different title because it was so controversial. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. I did not know that. Right. He then republished it under the title, title Ner Yisrael, and then after he died, his son republished it again back <laughs> under Magen of Ram, and so it's been ever since. But that's why if you look <laughs> at some editions of Shulchan Aruch, it says Magen of Ram Nun Yud. Oh, wow. Okay. I did not know that history. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, all right. So we're going to pop into this. So it starts with this question that he got from, you know, I guess, a balabas at mm -hmm. his program Suda. 
And right. As one does. Sounds, yeah. It sounds like a very Balabach question. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes all out with it. So the question is, if we're supposed to be all about Adela Yada and you know, Bar uh Bain Araham and Labarach Mordechai, we're not supposed to know the difference between you know, cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. So why do we sing Shoshanas Yaakov, which helps us remember which is which? <laughs> so he says, before I answer your question, let me tell you a Dvar Torah about Yom Kippur. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, he puts in parentheses like, Beso Yom Kippurim. So, mm-hmm. The Kabbalistic thing. Uh, there. That's, that's it's a little bit later, right? That's a little bit later. That's not the very beginning. Yeah. I just put that, that in. Yeah. Um, so he, he starts with this idea, which he'll get back to to explain to explain uh, his thing about Purim. But um, but first, he wants to use it to explain something about Yom Kippur. Um, he says this idea that the more similar two things are superficially, the more identifying the differences between them gets to the real essence of what they are. Both internally and externally, right? So he says, so we have on Yom Kippur, we have the Shnei HaSe'irim, the, the Sa'ir, the Sa'ir LaHashem and the Sa'ir LaAzazel. Mm-hmm. He says, and what could be more different than the than LaHashem and LaAzazel? And yet we have this halacha that the two, the two goats have to be exactly identical. They have to, they have to look the same. They have to be worth the same. Right, he has he has this line about like that's the Adela Yada of Yom Kippur, right? The you know whoever the shliach of the you know the Beit Hamikdash is who's buying these two goats is at a point of Adela Yada. He doesn't know which is Lashem and which is Lazazel. It looks exactly the same. Mm-hmm. But and then we do that Goral, oh, Goral. There's another connection to Purim, and we do we do that lottery. And it reveals like the true inner essence of which one is for Hashem and which one is for Azazel. But we can't get to that point until you know, unless we're at the Adela Yada first. Mm-hmm. We have to we have to first be unable to tell the difference between the two goats, and then we do something that reveals the deep, profound difference between them. That that one is Hashem and one is Azazel. And right, and then he says. Right, he said he seems he seems to be taking he se- he seems to be taking Azazel here as sort of a reference of like the Yitzhar Hara. He didn't use that word, but that, that, that's how I understand what he's saying. That like we have to take that Yitzhar Hara and throw it out, but but before we can do that, we have to recognize how similar it looks to that Sa'ir Lahashem. Right, Yitzhar Hara is Yitzhar Hara can look just like Yitzhar Tov's. Mm-hmm. Right, and then he says, "Okay, sa'ir. Sa'ir is an interesting choice of word for goat. Why did the Torah use the word sa'ir for goat? Wants well, to draw us back to the original sa'ir, Asav, and that's where we're now going to tie it into Purim, because because Purim is the day when we defeated Haman, who was from a Malik, who was from Asav." <laughs> And in order to defeat Esav, we have to first rec- recognize the similarity between ourselves and Esav. And, you know, he references, in order to get Esav's bracha, Yaakov had to look like Esav. There's no crit- he doesn't seem to have any criticism of Yaakov here for doing that, right? <laughs> right? You, he, he is... ha- you have to acknowledge your similarity to Esav in order to... But an external similarity. Yeah, mm-hmm. an external similarity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we... <laughs> We, he doesn't make this reference, but I was thinking because a lot of people, I guess, starting from the Chamalevowitz, um, point out this. But like Yaakov wrestling with that angel, like the Chamalevowitz spoke of it, you know, like the the, the Asav within him. Mm. You have to recognize that you know the Asav is a part of you before you can throw it out. And now he takes us back to Purim, right? He says Adela Yada. It's not that we're really not supposed to know the difference between Mordechai and Haman, mm. but we have to first get to the point of seeing all the superficial similarities and realizing that 
the difference between Mordechai and Haman is much more is much deeper and more and more profound. It's not a superficial difference. And I think that's his connection to the drinking is like the drinking sort of helps the superficialities dissolve away so you could see the real essential characteristic. And then I think like the final point is connecting it back to Shoshana's Yaakov. And he says Shoshana's mm-hmm. Yaakov tells us what the real essential difference is. So mm-hmm. it's good that we're thinking about the difference between Haman and Mordechai because first we drink so we can get past the superficialities. We can recognize all this external similarity. And then Shoshana's Yaakov tells us what the real difference is. And the, what's the real difference? The only real difference is that Haman made a bad choice. Haman tried to kill us, right? There's not <laughs> Haman. He and like he says, like it's dangerous to think this way too often because we need to like build up these images of ourselves as being profoundly different. But he mm-hmm. says when you really get down to it and you focus on it, one day a year, we're not all that different. You know, we have we have the same basic psychology, the same basic drives, and you know, Haman made a bad choice, but. You know, there but for the grace of God go I. Obviously, I do see here in the middle of the episode that his parenthetical episode, Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippurim, what? Okay, so, which is obviously very cute, although they are markedly different in their consumption, whereas one day we're not supposed to drink and one day we're supposed to drink quite a lot. Yes. But for, uh, I mean, in Zion, he mentions the, the wine, but that's, so what is he... Uh, I'm sort of, maybe I'm missing it. Like what's his take on the porn drinking aspect? Right. I mean, it's really, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a uh, it's a very Torah on what is Abdullah Yadam. And right. I mean, I think he's like, he, right. Like you said, he doesn't really talk so much about drinking. He talks about Abdullah Yada, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with his brief line that like drinking helps us get there. Drinking helps the superficialities dissolve away. So you could really uh-huh. see the true essence of something. So it, it dissolves the external similarities. Yeah. And then revealing the internal dissimilarity, which is apparently not much. Which is right, which is not right. much, which is all about which is all about a choice, a choice that we make. Mm-hmm. Right? We're not we're not inherently better. We have the same, you know, we have the same we we have the same Yitzhara. Yaakov, Yaakov and Asaf have the same Yitzhara. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we can succumb to it and become Asaf, right? There's nothing preventing yeah. that. Yeah. At the same time, in this section number seven, he does mention a little bit um, that is, I mean, he does mention wine a couple of times. He says, um, this Zotov Leif Amalek behind this having wine is part of the joy. Dahinu Shotov Leif Bosho Molko Shal Olam behind Havdala Shehobo Mavdi Ben Israel Amim. That God is making a Havdala? Or, or sorry, it's Mahmoud Goda Hasagana, that the danger is so great. That's hidden. How would you describe this? Sorry about the Tovle Malko Sha Olam. Yeah, I, I kind of skipped over that line because I don't really know what he's saying. Oh, okay. Um, I was I get more, very excited because he's mentioning wine and have dollar. Right, someone like who knows more about Rav Cook's Kabbalistic background probably could say something about what he's referencing there. This, this is Rav Hutner, right? I'm sorry, Rav Hutner. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But also with a also has a Kabbalistic background. Oh, okay. Um, even though he tends not to reference it explicitly. Uh huh. It is interesting because he says Bashum Milvad Purim. It's not possible for us to grasp any other time aside from the the right. Purim. He thinks it's, it's 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 dangerous. Focusing on the similarities between us and Asav is dangerous. Uh-huh. We might, we might I, you know, this is just sort of my interpretation here. Like, yeah. we might lose faith in ourselves if we if we're if we're too focused on how similar we are to Asav. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's an accident that this is where the wine's coming up. Yeah. Um, although it is interesting that maybe the 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 gods the the um Bosho Moko Moko Sha Olam that the the king of the world's uh goodness of his heart is done with a uh, Havdala wine. Yeah, which so is I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't know what God becoming intoxicated on Havdala wine means. That is uh yeah. And well, he, and that, but he, I mean, that then it ends in him saying, well, he differentiates between, you know, Jews and Gentiles. Yes. Um, I don't know that. It, I mean, I, I don't know what's going on there. Maybe he's thinking God's also getting drunk on this day. Um, not exactly sure. I mean, I, I'm sure I, I suspect it's something Kabbalistic. I'm sure it means something in terms of what Sphere is doing, what, when, but I don't know. 
Hey there, I wanted to break in yet again. Although I asked for support in financial ways because it does cost some money to make the hosting happen and other aspects of Jewish drinking happen. So your financial support is definitely appreciated. And don't forget, you can go to jewishdrinking.com slash donate. But also, another way of supporting the show and everything that Jewish drinking does is also to tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you like this content, if you like this show, maybe people you know also like it. So feel free to let them know, hey, I have this interesting episode I heard or a few episodes or whatever it is, or even a few clips. Feel free to share with your friends. All right. Thank you so much. Now back into the show. Rabbi Free, do you have any following follow-up thoughts on Rough Hutner's piece? I just really like it because it's creative, original, you know, <laughs> the, the way he, you know, took a question, you know, from, you know, some random person at the perm suit and, you know, that I would have probably just dismissed and, you know, made this whole profound bit out of it. <laughs> and I also like, I I don't know if it's shot in the Gemara, but like, I really like the message of it. The like realizing that, you know, people aren't born good or bad and, hmm. you know, we're not... It's not, not a foregone conclusion that, you know, Mordecai was going to be Mordecai and Haman was going to be Haman, and we got to be careful with our choices. Interesting. Interesting. You're right. It is kind of, uh, he takes the questions way more serious. I mean, it's a song, right? Yeah. And it's not it's not even anything necessarily much about the content of the song <laughs> so much. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing that obviously for me was really... I mean, Obviously, I really like the Rev Cook piece. It was not just for the result, but for what he did. This one was this meandering thing, which I don't know. At the same time, I, I mentioned to you like that was kind of an interesting uh, that second that the penultimate section, which was interesting. He mentions wine, even though I'm not really sure what he what's going on with you know God's heart being filled with wine and making yeah, that, but, that <laughs> uh, which is definitely interesting um, you know you know what else it reminds me of you'll appreciate this sure luke in the forest of dagobah where he you know he mm. fights the, the uh whatever it is his self kind of right yeah like he fights vader and it turns out it's himself yeah it's yeah. like the enemy the enemy looks like you yes like, there's something like very deep and very profound in that message that is you know seems to be true cross-culturally <laughs> yeah very interesting cool well thank you for the star wars reference <laughs> so wrapping up uh these two so as you mentioned there's not really a lot although i haven't really researched a whole bunch but it sounds like you've gotten more into the 20th century rabbis insofar as it pertains to i drinking. tried to find more stuff from the 20th century again i certainly yeah. i certainly have not done anything that even comes close to a complete literature search of what's been written of the 20th right. century. Right. But I mean, I imagine both the Aruch HaShulchan and Mishnah Brewer really provide sort of, a, and, and they're drawing from the Chai Autumn, a broad sense of sort of how rabbis in the 20th century are approaching yeah. uh, Purim drinking. Sure. So, I mean, in that sense, Rev Cook is definitely a very fresh take on the topic. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I guess I'd be kind of curious to see how, especially in the latter part of the 20th century, rabbis dealt with this especially with the rise of um even just thinking about driving right because when we think about this all the rabbis that we've dealt with I mean, maybe i mean driving hasn't really been much of a problem for purim um but that becomes a much larger problem with the technological advances of right. the car I mean, in the 20th might, century so you don't have to worry about my Ma Ma but i'm sure he was still telling you don't get behind the wheel of the car right i'm i'm we, it really doesn't pop up into this discourse. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, it's a, it's a broader issue about drinking and driving that's not just for Jews and not just for Purim, which is like, you know, if drinking is part of humanity forever and for always. So this new fangled technology of driving is uh, pr presents definitely a technological challenge to humanity. Um, we haven't really fully figured it out yet, but self-driving cars will definitely be good for for people drinking. Um, but obviously Uber is great for Purim, right? Yeah. Lyft, Uber. I'm open to sponsorships either way, but uh, <laughs> those, those are definitely uh, great. But uh, who knows? Maybe there'll be a special discount code on Purim uh, from Jewish drinking for Uber or Lyft. But yeah, it, 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 I, I'm curious to, to look into some of those reactions, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, especially as there's a greater sense of ubiquity of, of, automobiles especially in america but throughout the west as well 
so Rabbi Free, this has been interesting. Uh, definitely, a, a, I'm I love the Rev Cook piece. Cool, interesting conversation. Uh, before we go. Is there anything you would like to promote? So as you said earlier in my bio, I'm an editor at the lairhouse.com. So mm-hmm. if you like interesting, relevant, text-based, rigorous, non-polemical Jewish content, <laughs> uh, please check out the lairhouse.com. And if you really like it, please donate. <laughs> awesome. Great. All right, Rabbi Freed, thank you so much. This has been great. I, hopefully you have a great forum this year. And L'chaim. L'chaim.